All right, welcome back to Western Civ. We've completed talking about the uh, Soviet Union and Lenin and Stalin. So let's uh, switch over and talk about Hitler. Hitler. The uh, dates you need to know here, the rise of Hitler. 1919 will be the end of World War I, and we'll be taking it to 1939 when Hitler starts World War II. So this 20-year period, very important here. So let's look at Hitler's and his rise in Germany. First of all, let's look at Germany itself in 1919. We're talking about chaos here. World War I has ended, but it hasn't really ended for Germany. There's complete chaos. The country is in just completely fallen there. Kaiser is gone. What do you have? Well, from 1919 to 1923, a government might be in place, but things are very shaky there. The government that will be put in place, basically forced onto Germany, is a thing called the Weimar Republic. It is a republic. The Kaiser's gone, so there's no more emperor, no kings. It's a presidency. You'll have a presidency and a constitution. And it's based out of the city of Weimar. No longer Berlin is the capital. This is the city of Weimar. It's the city of poets and artists. So it's a very liberal city. And this is like a complete change from the militarism of World War I to a new world of a republic and liberalism and democracy. You get to vote and representation. We're hoping that uh, Germany will become like the United States, a peaceful nation. And again, the Treaty of Versailles hits during this time. So you find out, you come, you're a German, you come home from World War I, and you find out that your old government's gone. There's a new government completely opposite than the old government. And then you're hit with this treaty. The Allies will announce that they have done a treaty, and uh, Germany <laughs> will have to accept their Treaty of Versailles. And they're guilty. Germans are guilty of World War I. They're guilty for causing the war. It's in the treaty, the War Guilt Clause. And then they're hit with this, $32 billion in the American equivalent of, um, of German money, $32 billion worth. They owe the Allied nations because Germany has admitted guilt in this treaty. Well, the solution to the Weimar government is when faced with this huge debt, and they have you know, monthly bills to pay, is to just print the money. A government can just print money, so they start printing money. Their money is called marks. And what happens when you a government just starts printing money? Well, it causes inflation. But in Germany's case, the Weimar Republic's case, it's going to cause a hyperinflation as they just begin to print money uncontrollably to pay this debt off. It causes hyperinflation. Well, the problem with that, you know, inflation is bad enough, but hyperinflation is just your money is now worthless. This destroys the middle class. It destroys old people's savings. It destroys any kind of um, capitalist investments because you, the second you have money, it's worth nothing the next second. So this really just crushes their economy. It's a really bad decision on the part of the, on the, part of the Weimar government to try to handle the debt this way. But again, it's a crushing debt. No one's ever faced anything like this before. Well, into this springs communism. Communism flourishes where there is economic unrest. So communism, as the Russians predicted, is creeping into Germany. Well, who are these communist industrial workers? That's where you'll find them for the most part. And uh, a lot of industrial workers will be getting on this. Russia has become communist, so it's pretty clear. Marx has predicted this. Marx was a German uh, with a PhD. So he's bound to know what he's talking about, and it seems to be coming true that Germany will surely follow after Russia. So why not get on board? It's happening. It's a proven theory, so why not get on board and become a communist? So this is starts flourishing in the unrest of Germany. I want to mention one group of communists. They're called the Spartacists. Now, there are lots of different groups. Germany is a big country. But I just want to mention this one incident here, the Spartacists in the city of Berlin, led by Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg, a man and a woman here. And uh, their Spartacists, their communist will follow them and try to take over the city of Berlin. Again, this is the old capital city, the seat of conservatism, the old Brandenburg capital. And they will try to take over the government. It'll be a failure, but when they're captured, they will be taken out and shot, executed for their coup d'etat attempt. By the way, I want to point out to you also that they are of Jewish background. Now, this is going to come important later when Hitler starts pointing to stuff like this and saying, look, see, there's a tie between communism and Judaism. There is none. But in Hitler's mind, he wants to see it. And if you want to see it badly enough, you can see that there's some kind of connection. There is no connection. But a lot of Jews in Germany were drawn to communism. A lot of Jews in Russia were drawn to communism. But there's no connection between Judaism and communism. 
I want to talk about the Freikorps, the German soldiers who come back from World War I. These are the guys who are coming back from the front after the armistice in 1918. They're coming back to Germany, and they'll start to form up their units again to defend their country against all this unrest. Germans don't handle chaos very well. So they, they start forming Freikorps, free corps of men. These are veterans from the Western Front. They come back after the armistice is signed to a country they don't recognize. This isn't the country I left. They're armed. They brought their guns with them. They're trained. They know how to fight. And they're angry that this is not the Germany, that something's happening among the Germans. They, they hate these communists. And again, they're very conservative, and they want their old Germany back. They want to return to the glory. These are the men who can't understand why they lost in 1918. And now they're seeing Germany uh, being crippled here. They have a conspiracy. This is not just going to be Hitler spouting this. You're going to see it amongst a lot of Germans, especially World War I veterans, a conspiracy called the Dolchstoss theory. This is what they experienced in 1918 when they were moving, uh, advancing in the spring offensive toward Paris. They could see Paris in the distance, and then they were forced to stop. Well, there must be something wrong here. And they'll call it the Dolchstoss theory from 1918 when, they, when their offensives failed. That Germany had been stabbed in the back. Something went wrong, and it wasn't the leadership, and it wasn't the soldiers. It must have been back in Germany. And you'll start seeing, see here the soldiers, and you'll start seeing, this is a cartoon showing they were stabbed in the back. And there's a Jewish person there, a Jewish, and Hitler's going to say a Jewish communist conspiracy. So you see a lot of Germans believe they were stabbed in the back. By the way, uh, Jews served loyally and with distinction in World War I but there's just a tiny minority. So again, Hitler's not alone. Corporal Hitler in 1918 will believe this Dolchstoss theory and lots of other Germans. Here's Hitler in World War I. Well, you got street fighting. Communists taken to the streets, the Freikorps taken to the streets, and they are battling in the streets of Germany, all over Germany, war fighting. The Freikorps, here they have a tank digging trenches in the streets versus the communists in the factories. This is just terrible for Germany. And then, of course, in the back of all this is the Weimar government just printing up money to give to the French. This graph shows the value of the, of the Deutschmark as it just begins to drop off the board. One mark is worth one to one, and then one mark becomes worth, where it takes to take one trillion marks to equal what a mark used to be. Just un, That's hyperinflation unseen before. The money becomes absolutely worthless decision of the Weimar government. Here's a cartoon or a picture of children playing with box, box of money, blocks of money, people burning it in their furnace because it's cheaper than firewood. Just uh, terrible stuff, a wrecked economy. By 1923, the French aren't accepting the German money anymore because it's worthless, and so they will demand reparations to be paid, and when the Germans can't pay it, the French will occupy the Ruhr Valley, French soldiers marching into German territory. The war's been over for four years, and the French are now deciding to just occupy parts of Germany, just taking over the Ruhr Valley, which is an industrial valley. And this is what the French will say. Well, we'll just make your factories work for us. We'll just make you pay us that way. And of course, if you're a German, this is just unacceptable. Your government has allowed a state, important part of your country, to just be taken by the enemy. And the war's been over for four years. Well, it's not just Germany. If you look at Italy, Italy goes into chaos also. From 1919 to 22, there's just absolute chaos in Italy. Well, what do you do in a situation like that? Well, a lot of people turn to communism. You will see a lot of people adopting communism. You know, it's a, it seems to be a proven theory. Or you can go the other direction toward nationalism, that your country is absolutely perfect, absolutely wonderful. It's just bad people who have betrayed your country. So uh, this is where you're going to see Benito Mussolini. He had uh, been writing during the war, he had a newspaper journal, and uh, during this chaos, he will seize upon it that it's the country's been betrayed, and he can solve the problem. Here's Benito Mussolini, quite a fashionable guy. There's some more pictures of Mussolini. He loves the photo ops. Horseback, here he is wearing a zoot suit. So he'll be the first of these, uh, these post-war dictators. He will go by the name Il Duce, the leader. One man to rule, one man one man's vision, you can't trust democracy. The masses can be um, misled. But one man has the vision, Il Duce. His followers will wear black shirts. They'll call, be called the black shirts. And his purpose is to restore the glory of Italy. Back to 1914. No, no, no. Back before that to the greatest time ever in Italy. When, Rome, when Italy had a Roman Empire. 
In other words, he wants to not just rebuild Italy, but he wants to start reclaiming the Roman Empire. This is going to require conquest. It's going to require war. Well, his former government, we will label it fascism. He's starting a new type of dictatorial government, and um, he will focus on history. So a lot of his imagery will be pulled from the Roman Empire. And one of the images he likes is this fascia. This is the Roman symbol of authority. Whenever a Roman ruler or the representative of the ruler would go around, men would carry these fascia. It's a bundle of sticks with an axe blade in it. It's a symbol of authority. By the way, uh, we use this in our government today. If you get a picture of the Senate, maybe when uh, someone's giving a speech in the Senate, look in the background, there, fascia. So it's not an uncommon symbol, but this is where he's going to base his government, all these fascia, and so his government's called fascism. He is the first of the fascist rulers. Hitler will follow the example. Let's talk about the Nazis. Where does Hitler come from? Well, the Nazi party is going to start in a German city called Munich. It's right on the Austrian border. In fact, when Hitler grew up in Austria, when he moved to Germany, he came into Munich and joined the German army there. So that's where he is. Hitler, out of work after World War I, will make a little money spying on this party. The Munich government gave him money to go to the meetings of this Nazi party and report on it. You know, we think they might be trying to take down the government. So tell us what they're doing. Well, the party is called the NSDAP, the National Socialist German Workers Party. And that pretty much tells you what these guys are about. They, their initials tell you everything that you need to know. They're nationalist. Germany is a great country, never done anything wrong. They were backstabbed in World War I. Socialist. Now, this is a left-wing idea. This is a right-wing party, but this socialism is a left-wing, typically a left-wing idea that the government should run important businesses. Well, this is a nationalist will kind of take this from the left and say, no, if the government of a nationalist party runs these ideas, they'll be much better than socialism, maybe leading toward communism. This will be socialism under right-wing control. And then German, this will be a racist thing. It'll be a pro-German greatness of the German people thing. And it's a workers' party. It's not an elite, aloof, educated man's party. It's a blue-collar, working man party. They'll have their meetings in beer halls. And it's pretty rough and gruff there. So it's not a bunch of intellectuals. This is working men discussing the way that they want their government run. Hitler goes to the meetings. He likes them. He's not going to spy on them. And they like him. For the first time in his life, people begin to listen to what he has to say. And it turns out he has a great speaking voice. He speaks with an Austrian accent, which they find amusing. And then he just goes into these tirades, and they just really like this. So he will start taking over the Nazi party. He's a doer. He's a creative man. He will design uniforms for them. Their uniforms will be brown shirts. Germans like uniforms. And he says, we need to start wearing this brown shirts out when we go out in public. The groups of uh, Nazis will be called Sturmabteilungen. That pretty much tells you what they do. They are stormtroopers. They're going back to World War I. A lot of them are veterans. We call them the SA, Sturmabteilungen. This is Hitler's first organization. What do they do? They get to go to the beer halls, they get drunk, have their meetings, and they take to the streets to fight communists. So you'll have them marching through the streets looking for communists, claiming their neighborhoods. Here's some pictures of the SA in the early years marching through the streets of Munich. And that's what they do. They fight communists. If you're looking for, you know, as we go through this from the 1920s all the way to 1945 when Hitler kills himself, one common thread through this entire process is the element of violence. There's always violence. They're always focused on this brutality. And then when they're not being brutal, they kind of go on their reputation for brutality. They'll be able to intimidate the Germans, that there's always that threat of violence. Who do they hate? The Weimar government. They hate their standing government, that this is an alien government imposed upon them in a war they didn't lose or shouldn't have lost. And it's a weak government. It's ineffectual. It cannot govern them. And they don't like democracy. This new government is all about voting and let's become more liberal and have education systems and uh, letting women vote. No, anti-democracy. The democracy is a sign of failure. Democracy is not a German thing. It's, it lets 51% of the people who are maybe weak to lead. They don't like democracy. And then they talk about this, this Jewish conspiracy going back to 1918. And then they'll, with the rise of communism, they'll start to pair these together that this Jewish conspiracy and this communist takeover must be tied together. It's a conspiracy theory. It is not true, but they believe it at this time. And Hitler's going to latch on to that and really go for it. 
Another aspect that you'll see is this Aryan race idea. Um, not just a white superiority, but a certain group of whites, this Aryan people, blonde-haired, blue-eyed supermen, going back to ancient history, back before the Roman times, these people who lived in Central Europe, all the way up into Denmark and Sweden and Norway, these blonde-haired, blue-eyed supermen. Why isn't everyone blonde-haired and blue-eyed anymore? Well, that's part of this conspiracy that the Jews and communists are trying to take down the Aryan supermen. Well, by 1923, Hitler has organized this party and getting a whole lot of followers into it, and their, their parties become rallies. And by 1923, he is ready to take over Munich. It is called the Beer Hall Putsch. They start off in a beer hall, everybody's getting liquored up, and then they're going to go march down to City Hall and take out the, uh, the city, the government of Munich. So it's a coup d'etat. The word German word putsch is the, the French would call it a coup d'etat, a takeover. And they're aiming to take down the Munich government. They take to the streets. Here they are in trucks, being trucked into the town squares. So they can take down the city government. And someone tipped off the government. They'll call out the police. The police will bring out their guns and surround City Hall. Shots are fired, and the Nazi party collapses. It is a failure. The putsch is a failure for Hitler. His, his, his followers just ran once the shooting started. Well, I want to mention a couple of famous Nazis now. He's become so famous that there's some famous World War I leaders here. Ludendorff, the great German commander in World War I, had become a Nazi. He gets captured by the police, and they tell him he needs to disappear. You know, his reputation as a great German is at stake. Um, Hermann Goering, a World War I ace, had flown with the Red Baron. Red Baron had been killed in World War I, but Hermann Goering was one of his wingmen. He got shot in the groin. And uh, we're going to mention more about Goering later on. He'll stay, remain a Nazi. Um, he'll become two things, a morphine addict and the fact that he is, his genitalia was, was damaged uh, will stop the production of testosterone, which causes him to start expanding. He'll be very heavy, almost kind of the source of jokes later on. So uh, Hermann Goering shot in the groin, and Hitler himself gets trampled in all the chaos, and the police capture him. They find out he's the ringleader, and put him on trial. You know, this is treason to take over your city government like this. At the trial, Hitler gets the microphone. And of course, this is big news. You know, a coup d'etat has been attempted. And with the radio and newspaper coverage all over Germany now, they find out who Adolf Hitler is and what he has to say and listen to his speeches. And it turns into a popularity boon for him. The NSDAP now gains publicity all over Germany, and you will see these parties pop up. Every city now will have a National Socialist Party with Adolf Hitler as their man, their leader. Um, he is found guilty of treason, sentenced to five years, not executed as they had executed communist men who, and women who tried coup d'etats. He's sentenced to five years, and he'll serve only nine months in a country club style prison. It's in prison here that he writes his autobiography, his famous autobiography, Mein Kampf, literally, my struggle, my life, my journey has been a struggle. Um, he didn't actually write it. He dictated it. And so it's very rambling. It's just kind of him speaking off the cuff, kind of his rants, if you will. Uh, he dictated it to his party secretary who was in the cell with him. So he has a secretary in the cell with a typewriter, uh, Rudolf Hess. You don't need to remember that person, but if you like, if you are fascinated by the Nazis, um, Rudolf Hess will be there until World War One, until World War Two starts. This becomes a huge bestseller. By the time the war breaks out in '39, he'll have sold five million copies, which means he is going to be a millionaire. He's going to be a self-made millionaire. He could finance the party that way and finance his own stuff. One more aspect of this: it will remain in German. He will keep the copyright on it such that it cannot be translated. Well, it can be translated, but not translated and published. So Germans will be able to read it, but the rest of the world, unless you read German, you won't really be exposed to this stuff. I do want to mention one person will want it translated. Winston Churchill over in England will want a copy of this translated. When Hitler comes to power, he's gonna, he's Hitler, Winston Churchill is going to want to read what um, Hitler had been saying and what he has been saying he's going to do. Let's look at Hitler's plans as spelled out in Mein Kampf. Well, he wants to return the greatness of Germany. He talks about a master race, that the Germans are the Aryan race, they're the supermen of Europe. He talks about Lebensraum, that Germany has been confined into Central Europe. Which direction should they expand? To the east. 
for their Lebensraum, more space for Germany, to into Eastern Europe where they will rule over the Slavic people. Well, that's going to require some warfare if you're going to try to gain territory into the East. It's going to require war against the Soviet Union. So he's already talking of war here. And he says Germany would have already done this. We would have already had this in World War I, except for that conspiracy, that, Jew that Jewish conspiracy of trying to defeat us in World War I, says Hitler. He talks about dirty blood, that these Jews have come into Germany with the intention of wrecking the Superman's uh, blood, special blood. And then he ties them to communism. He'll talk about a Jewish communist conspiracy that Jews like Karl Marx have created communism to take over the world. And of course, this is completely bogus, but if you're a German in this situation, you might be willing to listen, and lots of them do, to this conspiracy theory. And that's what it caused the defeat in World War I, that the Jews and communists had conspired to destroy the Kaiser's plans. Well, as Hitler comes out of prison with his big best-selling book, there's bad news for him. Good news for Germany, bad news for Hitler. In 1924, a thing called the Dawes Plan is instituted. An American economist named Dawes has been sent over, I believe it's Calvin Coolidge, sent him over to help the Germans because, you know, we want to get paid back also. And um, he agrees, Dawes agrees, to restructure their debt. In other words, let's look at your debt, let's look at your financial payments, restructure the mark, and make you pay these things off. They tie the mark to the dollar. The dollar mark had no value. The dollar had value. So tie the mark to the dollar. Stop printing all these useless marks. And it works, slowly but surely. By 1924, 25, 26, the mark gains value. Germans can actually pay off the debt, and it revives the economy. The German economy starts to move now. Hiring people, factories open up. Here's a schematic of how it works. Um, you're not responsible for the schematic, but I just want to show you the Americans will lend money to the Germans, who will then pay off the Allies, who can then pay back their debts to the United States. So if you look at the numbers here, Germany receives $2.5 billion. They pay back $2 billion, which gives them half a billion dollars to spend. And then the Allies pay us back, and we end up making a little bit of money too. So it seems to be good all around. Well, well, maybe not for France and Britain, but, you know, America's not really fond of them at this point. More bad news, if you wanted to start World War II, is that in 1925, the Locarno Pact is signed. Then the Italian town of Locarno, France and the representatives of the Weimar government will meet, and Germany will now accept the Treaty of Versailles. Whew. Uh, you know, people were fearing the outbreak of another war, and now the Locarno Treaty helps ease everyone's tension. Germany is allowed, now that they accept the treaty, they're allowed in the League of Nations, which will prevent any further war. And uh, the news newspapers read at that time, peace at last. The Locarno Pact is signed. France and Germany have made peace. There will be no more war. And, of course, this is the Roaring Twenties. What a great time. America's booming. You know, we're back into isolation now in the Twenties. Um, we have introduced the world to jazz. 1920s is the jazz age. Um, we have our bars and all kinds of stuff going on. Uh, for Europe, you would go to a cabaret, these men's club where women might be dancing topless or something like that with jazz music playing so much more decadent than ours. And people are generally happier. Now that the economies are getting back on track, there's a decline of extremism as people move from left and the right back to the middle, give up their extreme views. The roles of the Communist Party will fall. The roles of the Fascist Party will fall all through the 20s. And then the bad news, October, 29, October 1929, the stock market crash in America and we take down Germany with us. The German economy was tired to our economy. As our economy collapses, so did the German economy. It sets off a world depression. The 1930s will be a terrible decade for most of the world, except Stalin's Russia, which is on the five-year plan system now, and booming, unless you got sent to a gulag.